Well, good morning and welcome. Delighted to have you this morning as we gather to worship our good Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, the first is that there is a baby shower coming up for Narika Jacques. Uh, it is going to be in the afternoon on March 4th. Um, if you are planning to come and you want to get a gift for them, uh, there is a link to their registry in our Sunday morning email. It's also in your bulletin, I think, too, but it might require quite a lot of typing if you look out there. But if you go into the Sunday morning email, you'll just be able to click on it uh, and find that. Also, um, there is a Young Life fundraising banquet coming up on Saturday, March 11th. Great way to find out, um, if you, especially if you're not that familiar with Young Life, what Young Life is about. Young Life is one of our partners that we work with closely to reach um, unchurched youth uh, in the city. And um, so if you're interested in coming to that, please RSVP to Alan. Alan couldn't be here, literally here, um, because he was sick this morning. He woke up with a sore throat. So you can pray for Alan too. Uh, also, um, this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of the season of Lent. Um, and so we've been encouraging you to consider um, trying to do something uh, to remember the significance of what Jesus went through as he um, suffered for us um, through this season. Um, we have a couple ways to help out with that. One is there's a devotional that you can do online uh, that's put out by all the university. There is a link to that in uh, your Sunday email, and there's also in your bulletin, and it's actually a short thing, so you could type that out. <laughs> so if you take this home, you could type that in your computer and find it out. Uh, and Errol Nadeau is also leading um, some people through some spiritual exercises. And I'm guessing if you want to do it, you could still quickly put your hand up or let him know today. And he's giving him a, a nod. So if you want to participate in that, it's basically an imaginative, imaginatively, it is using your imagination, but it's a way of praying through scripture uh, is essentially how I describe it. I've done it several times with Errol and I've appreciated it every time. Last thing is we have our annual general meeting along with a small special general meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. Not 7.30, 7 p.m. Um, and we would really love to have quorum because we have a number of important decisions to make at that meeting. So if you're a member and are able to come, please do. We need at least 15 of you to get quorum for our annual general meeting and 25 of you for our special general meeting. Um, if you can't come, uh, for the special general meeting only, you can help us reach quorum by um, giving your vote to someone else by proxy. So if you are not able to come, but you're a member, you can contact Stan about um, giving your vote to someone else, and that will help us get to the 25 mark and hopefully uh, pass those small revisions to our bylaws that we've been trying to pass for a few months now, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it for announcements. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 16, which reads, Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, and apart from you I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out their libations of blood to those gods or take their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful, faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for your goodness, for the fact that 
You have not abandoned us, but have pursued us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and have filled us through faith in him with your own presence, your very Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that now, through your Spirit, you would fill us with abundant life, with the joy that comes from belonging to you and being yours, and that you would make us rejoice at the great promise of life that you have given us, the inheritance of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So in the knowledge of these things and being filled with your Spirit, we now come to you and eagerly and gratefully give you thanks and praise. We do this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing uh, hymn number 528. This is hymn number 528, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. be seated. And would you now please bow with me as we pray. Lord God, ruler of heaven and earth, in your mercy we ask that you would hear the prayers of us, your servants. For Lord, we recognize that if you were to record only our sins, not one of us could dare to enter your presence. But you have offered to us, through Jesus your Son, forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. And so we freely and openly confess that we have known your expectations of us, but have not always been willing to fulfill them. We acknowledge that indifference and lethargy have taken root in our hearts. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us and revive us, establishing us again the way of life, truth, and fruitfulness to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. To everyone who has become a child of God through faith in Jesus, God has said this through his word, 
I have swept away your transgressions like a mist and your sins like a cloud. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. So my brothers and sisters, let us accept the acts of God on our behalf and return gratefully and joyfully into full fellowship with him. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come forward. All right. So kids are free to head on out to Adventure Time. And it's now time for the prayers of our community. So this is our opportunity to bring before our Lord and Savior our requests, our thanksgivings, and any word of encouragement uh, you may have from the Lord to share with your brothers or sisters in Christ today. Um, so one prayer request that I know of um, right away is um, that David and Dorothy uh, have a friend named Jane in Calgary who has uh, cancer and they are going to be mapping her brain this Thursday to try and next week do some targeted radiation on her brain, which is a very high risk procedure. So we want to remember Jane in our prayers uh, this morning. And also, Alan's sick, so we'll pray for Alan, too. But I know there's more stuff out there, so raise your hand. Yeah, Jason. All right, well, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you as your children, um, not by right uh, or through our own merit, but we come on account of the grace that you showed us through Jesus Christ, and on account of the fact that you have put your spirit in us so that we can cry out, Abba, Father, and know that you hear our voice and that you love us. And so, Father, we bring forward our requests and our pleas for your help. Lord, we pray. So Lord, we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and we trust that by the power of his hand and his grace, you will bring forth what is best and good in all of our lives. We trust you with these things. Amen. I'd now like to invite Rick to come and read scripture for us. Scripture reading this morning is, is um, I think it's from 2 Timothy chapter 1. Is that correct, Grant? That's correct, yes. <clears throat> I hope I have the right passage here. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, reading from verse 1 to verse 18. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us as timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. 
He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to trust in you and to put in our hope in you. And so, Lord, as we listen to the words that you inspired Paul to write to Timothy this morning, we pray that you would open our eyes and help our minds to understand what is written there, and that you would do a further work by your Spirit to soften our hearts so that we might receive that word, and that through it you would produce life and fruitfulness within us, no matter what opposition might come our way. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for us. Amen. So I have a soft spot for the book of 2 Timothy. Full confession. <laughs> I want to be just totally upfront that this book has a special place in my heart and has been a great source of encouragement to me over the years. There are so many helpful words that the Lord gave Paul to write in this letter that I've benefited from personally. For example, words like in chapter 1, verse 18, where Paul writes, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted him my whole life until that day, the day when Christ comes and makes all things right. The news that everyone who gives their life to Jesus has this security, this promise, that Jesus himself is the one who will bring us safely to the end, no matter what happens, has been a great encouragement to me. Or words like chapter 3, verse 16, which declares that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that, here's the purpose, the servant of God, you and I, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, sometimes when reading some of the harder words or stories in the Bible, these words from 2 Timothy have been an encouraging reminder to me that everything in the Bible is written for our benefit, no matter how hard or even confusing it may look to us at the time. Or then there are the words in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, which instruct us to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, a little over seven years ago, when I felt God prompting me to put my name out there, to be called to serve at a different church, these words, I think, were given to me as a prayer. I prayed them a lot, anyway. That I felt God was calling to me that regardless of how big or small a church it might be, or where in Canada it might be, that God would lead me to a church where I could pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And I want you to know that I feel like God answered my prayer with you all. I really mean that. It's been just a joy to be here. And I feel like you are an answer 
to that prayer in my life. So I just want to start by saying I have a bit of a soft spot for the book of 2 Timothy, even though I know a lot of people kind of don't give it a lot of attention. It's been a great source of encouragement for me personally. And my hope in doing this series on 2 Timothy is that God will make this short letter a great source of encouragement to you as well. And I truly believe it can be, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this series. (laughs) But one of the reasons why I feel so confident it can be so helpful and encouraging is this. It's because it's been my experience that the people who are the most encouraging are people who have already gone through the difficulties in life that you and I may be going through right now and can speak from personal testimony about the grace and mercy that God gave them in those difficult times. I have been able to witness this in other people frequently as a pastor. I've been able to see that it's the people who have been brought through the fire by the power and grace of God who are best positioned to encourage those currently in the fire. It is the person set free by Jesus from addiction who has a special power to encourage those still stuck in addiction. It is the person who has gone through family trauma, be it divorce or abuse or abandonment, who by the grace of God has been brought through that into the place of harmonious relationships years later, who then is capable of giving powerful encouragement to those who are currently struggling in marriages or in relationships with a child or parent, in their loneliness or in their feelings of abandonment. And 2 Timothy offers us this kind of encouragement. It is encouragement from one who has gone through the fire by the power and grace of God and was then commissioned by that same God to write a letter of encouragement to a younger Christian named Timothy. Second Timothy is the last letter written by the Apostle Paul. It was written while he was imprisoned in Rome, not for the first time, the time mentioned at the end of the book of Acts, but now a second time at some point later, we don't know exactly when, but under what seems to be a much more serious set of charges. As Paul himself mentions near the end of this letter, the fact that he survived his first defense meant that he was delivered, saved from the mouth of the lion. In other words, his life was on the line here. And although we can't know for certain, there is evidence that suggests from church history that Paul did not succeed in his second defense and was executed for his faith only a short time after writing this letter. But even with such a serious threat of death hanging over Paul's head, he begins his letter with these words. He writes, Paul, an apostle once sent of Jesus Christ by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. In prison, under a death sentence, Paul is confident of Jesus' promise of life, not only for himself, but for all people who believe in his name. In other words, Paul has not been swayed from the court for him by Jesus. He has been sent by Jesus to declare the good news, the promise of life that is in Christ, And if God chose him and chooses to send him to prison to do that, Paul is content to go along with that plan. We see this in the fact that Paul refers to himself in verse 8 as his prisoner, that is the Lord's prisoner, not as Caesar's prisoner. In Paul's mind, he is only in prison because Jesus has chosen to put him in prison. And he has put him there for a purpose, Paul declares, a purpose that lines up with the calling and the gifting that Jesus has given him. The calling to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles, to the nations beyond Israel. Now, for a man on death row, Paul is, in this sense, almost unbelievably in a good state of mind and heart. In fact, Paul himself speaks of it as an act of God. In verse 8, he says that the suffering for the gospel is possible only by the power of God. In short, Paul has been led through the fire not by his own strength, but by the power of God. And therefore, he's not concerned so much with his own suffering or shame. Quite the opposite. He actually urges Timothy in verse 8 to join with me in suffering for the gospel. He's not trying to get out of it. Paul's concern is not for himself. He has already been brought past the fear of his own suffering and of his own shame through the power that Jesus Christ gave him 
through the Spirit. About that Spirit, Paul writes in verse 7, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You see, Paul is already in that place, living in the power of the Spirit. He has gone through the fire by the power of that Spirit. And Paul's concern in 2 Timothy, then, is actually with the vast number of Christians who have not made it through that fire, who are not living in the power of the Spirit that God gives to each one of us. In chapter 4, verse 16, Paul writes, At my first defense... No one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. And then in chapter 1, verse 15, Paul writes, You know that everyone in the province of Asia, which is a different part, this is where Ephesus, the city he's writing to, is, not near Rome. You know that everyone in this area too, in the province of Asia, has deserted me, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. So Paul is not against those who did not stand with him under the threat of death and shame. Paul is not against all of the churches in the Roman province of Asia, the churches that he himself planted, who now seem to have distanced themselves from him because they don't want to be associated with him. And whatever he's being charged of, they just don't want to be connected to him anymore. Now, whatever his charges must have been, they must have been extremely possible because nobody's touching him with a 10-foot pole. Nobody wants to be around him. And yet Paul still writes, may it not be held against them. May it not be held against them. Why? Because he is for them. He's not against them. He wants something for all of them. He wants them to experience the same thing he has. He wants them to know firsthand the mighty power of God in the face of opposition. Like him, he wants them to be able to say the words that he writes in chapter 4, verse 17. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth. Paul was faithful to God's calling, even under the threat of death and shame, and God was faithful to deliver him, to save him. Therefore, like he has experienced, Paul wants all believers to experience the same thing. To know what it's like to exercise the spiritual gifts that God gives to each one of us. And in so doing, experience the kind of deliverance from God that Paul himself experienced. This is why Paul's first command in the letter is the command that we find in chapter 1, verse 6, which reads, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. With Timothy, the command has personal urgency. You see, no one else has walked with Paul through the fire. No one. And Paul does long for another believer to walk with him in this time. That is why Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. He is literally asking Timothy to come to him, as we'll see later. He's asking him to stand behind him in this trial to walk through that same fire that he, God has just brought him through, and Paul wants him to do it, not so much for companionship, although he does want that too, but first and foremost, for the sake of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. In light of the spiritual gift that God has given to Timothy and Paul's recognition of the value of it, Paul is urging Timothy to be bold and to come and exercise that gift with him where he is. My brothers and sisters, God has preserved this letter from Paul to Timothy, not just for Timothy, but for us too, to encourage us in that same way. That through this letter to Timothy, that Jesus might call us to trust in him enough to exercise our gifts in the, that he has given us, and that by the power of the same spirit that was in Paul, which is also in us, we might walk through the fire into the calling and purpose that God has given us for our lives here and now. Therefore, 2 Timothy is God's encouragement for you and me to walk through the fire for the sake of the gospel by the power of God. And this encouragement is given through Paul, a man who has done exactly that 
and can therefore offer words that are truly helpful for everyone who longs to follow Jesus. Therefore, only two questions remain. First question, what is the fire? What is the real trial he's been going through? And second, how does God help, walk, help us walk through it? So what is the fire? That is, what is the one pre or the pressure or oppression that threatens us to make us shrink back and not go through? And two, how does God give us power and help us overcome it? Now this morning, I'm only going to focus, well, I'm going to focus mainly on that first question, the question of the fire. What is the opposition? And then next week, and carrying on, we'll pay more attention to the second. Um, I'll just touch on it briefly at the end. So the first question, what is the fire? What is it that caused everyone to desert Paul and not stand up with him for the gospel? Now, generally speaking, the Bible as a whole would name three things that oppose us and knock us off course in our pursuit of following Jesus. And those three things are these. The flesh, that is our own sinful and selfish desires. The devil, the father of lies who seeks to deceive us. And the world, that is the pressure of human sinful society that tries to squeeze us to conform to its norms, what it sees as good, as opposed to what God declares as good. In the letter of 2 Timothy, Paul's concern focus is on the last three of these opponents, on the world. Specifically, Paul is concerned here with the world's use of suffering and of shaming to throw us off course. As we read again in verse 8, So do not be ashamed, threat number one, of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but rather join with me in suffering, threat number two, for the gospel by the power of God. Now the suffering, though, that Paul refers to is, is not some sort of self-imposed suffering. It is a suffering from the world that is brought on us by the actions of others. We see this in verse 11, where Paul is talking about the work he's been doing. He says, And of this gospel I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. So Paul has been preaching the gospel, and because of what he's preaching, other people are seeking to hurt him and even kill him. That is, the world, uh, sinful human society, resists the call of the gospel, the call to submit to Jesus as Lord, rather than go our own way. That is why I am suffering, Paul tells us. But Paul's biggest concern was not just the threat of suffering. The biggest threat is what Paul names next. Verse 12, it says, That is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame. It is shame, not suffering, that is the bigger threat to you and me, to all those who believe in Jesus and want to follow him. Shame, not suffering, is the biggest threat. As John Stott rightly comments on this verse, we are all more sensitive to public opinion than we would like to admit. And we tend to bow down readily before its pressure, like reeds shaken by the wind. My brothers and sisters, these words were written 50 years ago, back when it was a lot more cool to be a Christian than it is today. And even more than this, shaming has become a much more common and more powerful force in our culture over the past 50 years, especially with the arrival of social media. 50 years ago, if a kid in high school tripped in the hallway, a dozen or so kids might laugh and the kid would experience embarrassment maybe for a few days and it would be over. Today, sometimes, when a kid trips in a hall, gets captured on video by smartphone, turned into a funny video with silly music and posted online where every kid in the school can watch it over and over and over again. And it's not just kids who suffer this kind of shaming. <clears throat> in 2013, Justine Sacco, a 30-year-old director of communications at a large company, was on her way from New York to visit her family in South Africa. While waiting in the airport in London, she decided to tweet, for those who don't know what it is, Twitter, that's an online social media platform, to tweet what she thought was a sarcastic comment that her measly 170 followers might find funny. She wrote, and it's very inappropriate, 
She wrote, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Then she turned off her phone, boarded her 11-hour flight to Johannesburg. While in the air, she had no idea that people had found her joke so offensive that her comment became the number one trending tweet on Twitter with tens of thousands of people chiming in on how angry they were. By the time she landed 11 hours later, Justine had already been fired from her job and people were standing there waiting with cell phones to take pictures of her when she finally turned on her phone to see the news. A journalist who inter interviewed her shortly afterwards wrote, her extended family in South Africa were African, African National Congress supporters, the party of Nelson Mandela. They were longtime activists for racial equality. When Justine arrived at the family home from the airport, one of the first things her aunt said to her was this, this is not what our family stands for. And now by association with you, you've almost tarnished our whole family. Justine said, I cried out my body weight in the first 24 hours. It was incredibly traumatic. You don't sleep, you don't wake up. I mean, you wake up in the middle of the night and you don't even know where you are. That is the power of shame and shaming. Now, this is an extreme example, and it is an example where the person who was shamed did do something wrong. They say it's something they should never have said. But when it comes to the gospel, the truth, we must face the fact that we will have to face the opposition of being shamed, even though, Paul writes, there is no cause for shame. Specifically, Paul identifies three things that the world will shame us for, even though there is no cause for shame. In verse 8, Timothy is told not to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he's told not to be ashamed of me, that is Paul, another Christian. And then he's told towards the end to not be ashamed of the gospel. John Stott nicely summarizes the three by saying that we will be tempted as Christians to be ashamed of the name of Christ, to be ashamed of the people of Christ, and to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The name, people, and gospel of Christ. Now, shame at the name of Jesus, Jesus is obvious, I think. Anytime you've been amongst a group of people and you have felt reluctant to admit you are a Christian, you have felt shame at the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul does not hold anything against Timothy or against any of the other believers for having those feelings. He's not upset about those feelings. He expects those feelings, I would argue. What Paul wants is to help us all overcome those feelings so that we can live out the calling and purpose that God has given us. You see, you and I cannot eliminate the possibility of feeling shame, but we can trust God to give us the power to not let, us, let it control us, the power to walk through the fire. Now, shame at the people of Christ I think is a little less obvious until somebody points it out to us. So Paul seems to be acknowledging that part of the reason why people did not stand with him and maybe distancing themselves from him was not just because of suffering, but actually because of shame. They were embarrassed by him and embarrassed to be associated with him. Have you ever felt that way about another believer? <laughs> I know I have. But this kind of shame, I believe, in my opinion, is what is truly devastating the church in Canada. I really think it is. It is devastating us. It is so popular to say that the, much of the division amongst us is due to what the world would call polarization. But having radically different viewpoints is not a source of division for the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus deliberately called a tax collector named Matthew and a zealot named Simon to be part of his 12 apostles. One of them had spent his life helping the Romans oppress the Jews. The other has spent its life trying to literally kill Romans to set the Jews free. You don't get more polarized than that, and yet in following Christ, they served side by side. The problem, I would argue, is that when the polarized sides start shaming each other. During COVID, I had a number of people who attend a variety of churches, reach out to me and tell me why they weren't going back to church. 
Here are a couple of a couple typical examples of what I heard. Person one. I don't believe taking the vaccine is safe, so I haven't had it. But I'm afraid to go back to church because I'm afraid what people will think of me. It was shame, not polarization, that kept them home. Person two, I'm a physician, and I support encourage, encouraging people to take vaccines, but most of my friends at church have been posting really aggressive things about why vaccines are so bad. I'm afraid that if I go to church, they're going to ask me what I think, and when I tell them that it's going to ruin our friendship. It was shame, the fear of negative response from other people that kept them home. And as of today, neither of them have gone back to church. And the reason they're not going back isn't because of polarization, it's because of the power of shame. The fear of what other people will think of them and the impact that will have on how they're treated. Now, Paul is not so much arguing that people in church need to shape up and stop shaming each other, although that is implied, I would say. Paul's message is rather to the individual who is facing the threat of shame. His word is a word of encouragement to those people I've just quoted, individuals saying that God will give you power to go through that shame and into life, the life that God calls you in, where you express the gifts God has given you in the church and in the world. So there's shame at the name of Christ. There's shame in regards to the people of Christ, not wanting to associate with other Christians. But there's also shame at the gospel of Christ. There are certain things that Jesus says or that the scriptures say that others simply find offensive. Their reaction to these words of Jesus tempts us to either change them, ignore them, or explain them away. More than suffering, more than deception, shame is the mother of false teaching in the church. Shame is what makes us think or feel things like, Jesus can't have meant that. He must have meant something else. And more often than not, it is this pressure from shame that succeeds in getting us to try to change the unchangeable gospel. My brothers and sisters, this, I would argue, is the fire that opposes us to, not just Paul and Timothy, us. The fact that whether we like it or not, we will feel the power of shame, the power of the world's opinion of us. And this shame will pressure us to give up what is truly good. Shame pressures us to shy away from association with the name of Jesus our Lord, to distance ourselves from other Christians, and to abandon or change the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the good news is that God gives us the power to overcome shame, to walk through the fire and into the life that God calls us to. And this is the question that we're going to explore in much more detail in the weeks to come. How does God help us walk through that fire? How does he empower us to go through suffering and shame and live out the purpose and calling that he's given to us? And one of the most helpful and important ways is the simple guarding of the gospel. You may remember Paul said to Timothy in verses 13 and 14, What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching. Live it out with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. So we'll look at the gospel and how it helps us more in more detail next week. But today I just want to leave you with the encouragement that Paul gives in verses 6 and 7, which read, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Stott helpfully comments by writing, Notice that, though a particular spiritual gift was given to Timothy, Paul marks that the gift of the Spirit himself has been given to us. That is, to all who are in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God is in you. All of the power, love, and self-discipline that you need to overcome whatever suffering or shame is standing in your way is ready and waiting inside of you through the presence of God's Spirit in you. 
And this same Spirit has also given you gifts. If you are a Christian, you have the Spirit, and you have at least one, probably more, spiritual gifts. And one of the most effective helps for overcoming suffering and shame is simply to fan those gifts into flame. If you are unsure of what your gift is, pray for it. In fact, Paul tells us elsewhere that we should seek all the gifts, pray for them. God never gives them all to one person, Paul reminds us, but we should be seeking them. We should be asking for them. So this week, I encourage you to pray for God to reveal to you the gifts that he has given to you and then pray for him to give you some more. Whether that's serving or prophecy or teaching or encouraging or giving or leading or showing mercy, you can see all of these in places like Romans chapter 12. Pray for God to give you the special ability by the power of his spirit to do these kinds of things. So first then this week, pray for these things. But second thing, use those gifts. Is there an opportunity to teach your kids or a neighbor or a friend something about the promise of life in Christ Jesus? Then teach them. Is there an opportunity to show mercy to someone else? Then show mercy. Whatever God, gift God gives you, use it. Fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. It will really help you to get through the fire of shame and suffering and into the purposeful life that God is calling us to live. So this week, simply this, pray for gifts and use those gifts as much as you can. Next week, we'll get into the gospel and how it also helps. But we are threatened by real opposition. Suffering and shame is something that really does press against us and tries to intimidate us. But the power of the Spirit of Jesus who lives in us is more than enough to overcome those challenges, to lead us through the fire. Amen? Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do not leave us without help. And Father, we freely confess, I confess along with it, that so many times we would rather just not have the fire. We would just wish it was not there. But Father, we recognize that there are times when you do ask us to walk through it, where in order to be faithful to the gifts and callings that you have given us, we have to walk through and resist the powers of things like suffering and shame in order to be faithful to you and see the fruit that you want to bring forth from our lives. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask for your help, for we know we cannot do it on our own strength, but only by your power. So this week, Lord, we pray that you would reveal to us the gifts that you have given us by your Spirit and that you would help us to exercise those gifts so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you might do works in us that encourage us and say, yes, it is worth, it's worth walking through this because we can see the fruit that you bring. We can see the life that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name and for his glory. Amen. So we're going to close today by singing a hymn called, I Know Whom I Have Believed, which is mostly a quote from 2 Timothy chapter 1. So would you please stand with me as we sing hymn number 527, I Know Whom I Have Believed.
So the two things I've asked is for you to pray for the giftings that God has already given you and for him to give you more, and then to exercise those giftings. And you can get started on the first one of those right now. We have a prayer room on my left, your right. And if you have, especially if you've never asked for God to reveal his gifts to you, I encourage you to go there as Paul has did with Timothy, where he laid his hands on Timothy and prayed for him, and God gave him a gift. I encourage you to take the time to go and pray and ask that prayer and to receive the gift that God wants to give you. And now may you go in peace, knowing that the Holy Spirit of God is in you and that his gifts are in you as well. May you fan them into flame and in doing so, be set free from the powers of shame and suffering. Go now in peace and serve your Lord.